So um, I know it's late and everyone's tired, and so the good news is that this is going to be a bit of kind of light philosophy and fairly kind of light on the, uh, the technical details. Um, maybe that'll be bad news for a lot of you. Um, I maybe I should say that if Nick's a tourist in the land of string theory, um, he's the kind of really good tourist, right? That really tries to understand the culture and kind of you know gets involved and stays a long time. I'm like the person who flies in for the weekend, uh, <laughs> around the city, says some opinionated stuff, and then flies out. <laughs> um, that obnoxious tourist that gets in your way. Um, all right. Um, and maybe say about where I'm coming from. I mean, I've spent a lot of time thinking about kind of classical space-time theories, um, and you know, I was interested in controversy, and I was listening to people talk about the ADS CFT theorem, and I thought, huh, I've thought a lot about different representations that seem to have different dimensionality. Maybe I can say something useful. So this is my attempt, and um, we'll see if it works. Um, so what I want to do here is suggest an approach to thinking about cases in which we have two descriptions of different dimensionality that we in some sense think are equivalent. We think they're maybe representations of the same thing, or maybe we have um, this formal sense of duality in string theory and we don't know what we want to say about it yet, but there's this kind of um, equivalence postulated between the two. Um, I was just that thinking clearly about maybe a more familiar case, um, in this talk it's going to be uh, gauge theories on fiber bundles, um, might help a little bit when we come to working out what's at issue and what we should think about when we think about uh, string theoretic dualities that involve descriptions of different dimension. Um, okay, so just a preview. Um, as you've heard quite a lot in the last couple of hours, holographic principles and conjectures, there's this big class of conjectures um, that are certain equivalents between some kind of higher dimensional bulk gravitational theory and a lower dimensional field theory on the boundary of the higher dimensional space. Um, not much of what I'm going to say is going to depend on the details of which one of these things we choose, except that I'll say a tiny bit about um, conformal symmetry at the end. Um, so I guess it's interesting that sometimes you have conformal field theories um, on one side of this equivalence. Um, but I'm just going to take, I'm going to pick the most common ads -CFT theory just as an example. I won't say much technical about it. So that's a, ads -CFT is sort of a generic name for a class of these kinds of conjectures that are related to string theory. Um, and obviously, as we've heard, dualities of dimension raise some pretty serious philosophical issues. I mean, there's this feeling that this is the most extreme duality that string theory offers us, right? This is crazy. We have, you know, higher dimensional theories. Um, we're being told they're equivalent to lower dimensional descriptions. They sound deeply ontologically different. Um, and so the questions of whether we should see the two descriptions as representing the same reality um, seem particularly pressing. Um, and supposing we do think this is duality, how on earth do we philosophically make sense of the idea that representations with different dimensionality could describe one and the same reality? Isn't that just the kind of thing our fundamental picture has to say there's a fact about, the dimensionality of the world? Um, but I feel like this isn't the first time we've come across formulations of theories with different dimensionality. Um, so here's two examples. I'm not going to suggest the analogies go through. I'm also not going to get to talk about one of them because I discovered my talk was too long. Um, but um, I, I cut my slides, believe it or not. It's a rare thing uh, in this. I was probably still going to go over. <laughs> I don't have 29 slides. I put them all to the back, so yeah, it won't be too bad. Um, right, so here's two examples of places where philosophers have ended up bickering about dimensionality, effectively. Um, one case is gauge theories. Um, it's the one I'm going to talk about. It's actually probably pretty philosophically obscure, but there are people who bicker here. Um, so you've got geometrical versus ordinary space-time representations of gauge theories like electromagnetism. Um, and so you have a kind of argument between the fiber bundle substantibilist um, and somebody who has perhaps a more conventional approach to the ontology of um, gauge theories. Um, and then the second example could be the debate over configuration space realism in quantum mechanics. Um, you can ask me about that in the question session, but there's of course a debate between people who think that um, fundamentally quantum mechanics is about a wave function on three dimensional um, configuration space and those who think that quantum mechanics is about some state interpreted differently um, on space time. Um, so thinking about what those debates are about, I think it's going to shed some light on the ADS CFT case. Um, and I'm going to argue for an approach, a kind of slightly unconventional approach to those questions, um, in which we divorce questions about space-time from questions about fundamentality. And I think that's going to be helpful uh, in the string theoretic case. Um, so here's an outline of what I'm going to do. Um, maybe worth saying something about the structure of this talk and the attempt to put it into 30 minutes, 
which is that um, I think some of this is premised on some very particular views about space-time I have, but you know, I can argue for it at great length, and of course I don't have great length to argue for them, and I want to get to the end so that I actually have the right to be at a quantum gravity conference. Um, so do ask questions as we go along, but I'm probably going to say lots of really controversial things in the setup, um, which we should argue about, but if we argue about them one by one, we might never get to the end. So I may be safe telling me I'm completely wrong in my view of space-time. Uh, for the end and ask clarificatory questions about just how wrong-headed my view of space-time is um, and on the way along. Um, okay, so let's start away from quantum gravity. Let's just set up the kind of analogy um, that I want to set up. It's not a perfect one, but here's a debate. Um, what's the basic ontology of a gauge theory like classical electromagnetism? There's lots of options. There are lots of moves. Talk about the Harold Bohm effect, you worry about extending your ontology to non abelian gauge theories. Um, and eventually, you might come down to thinking um, there are a couple of popular options, and, and perhaps the most popular in the philosophical literature is what you might call the Holonomies approach. Uh, so, this is the kind of approach that um, Richard Healy and Gordon Bellet take. So, they take the basic, um, they take the most sort of perspicuous formulation of the theory to be one in terms of um, the Holonomies. Um, of Curve. So basically, you integrate the vector potential around the curve, you get the holonomy, and they think that's kind of the basic uh, unit of your theory, if you like. Um, electromagnetic properties are to paths in ordinary space-time. Um, now, in another corner, and I'm quite happy this corner is now properly populated, so um, I talked about fiber bundle substantivalism, um, but it was a bit of a straw man in my, um, uh, when I was a graduate student. Um, because no one had come out as a fiber bundle substantivalist. And then Frank Hartzinius wrote a book, and he's a fiber bundle substantivalist, and I can beat him up, which is great. Um, so there's this other view called fiber bundle substantivalism, um, which is a saying is explicitly held by Frank Hartzinius, but you see it in all of this literature that you get about um, geometrical descriptions of gauge theories being somehow fundamental or more explanatory. There's a kind of hint of it, they don't quite come out. Um, I think you see it in the physics literature too. I think someone like Michael Berry occasionally um, hints at this kind of view. Um, so these people know that you can represent the electromagnetic situation by a fiber uh, bundle over space time. Connection corresponds to the electromagnetic potential. And then they reify that higher dimensional space. So someone like Frank Reitzini says the following. One should take fiber bundles and their parts to be the objects that exist. Furthermore, we should take the connections and the sections of those fiber bundles to correspond to fundamental properties of the fiber bundle. Um, so here's a case where we basically have two representations. Everyone's happy there's two representations, right? And then you have people arguing over which one's the real fundamental um, representation. And they've obviously got different dimensionality. A fiber bundle um, uh, is a different dimensionality from space time. Um, OK, so very, very surface. Um, what about to mention in the ADS-CFT correspondence? Well, I mean, as we've heard, uh, one version of the ADS-CFT um, correspondence holds the equivalence of these two things. And the equivalence in this sort of deep sense, I won't kind of try and philosophically unpack that, but more beyond empirical equivalence, right? These things are meant to have isomorphic Hilbert spaces. That's the idea. Um, and so you have a 10 dimensional type 2B string theory, which is on five dimensional anti de Sitter space with five compactified dimensions, and that's meant to be equivalent to a four dimensional conformal field theory on the boundary of that space. Um, I'm going to say this is deep and complex, but really all I'm going to use is just the fact I'm going to take it for granted that this is right, um, which, I mean, who knows if it is, that this conjecture is correct, and just wonder you know, what you should say about that. That's what that's. Um, I mean, even if you think of this as a, you don't worry about these five compactified dimensions because you think they're in some sense really internal or not really spatially temporal, you still at the very least got a five versus a four dimensional description of the world being asserted to be equivalent. Um, okay, so supposing we accept that equivalence, um, supposing we brush under the carpet the fact that nobody thinks this is um, a realistic theory of anything, so it's a bit of an academic exercise, um, we have three interpretational options, right? We insist that the bulk theory is the one that faithfully represents reality, and that the boundary theory is somehow auxiliary to it. We could insist that the boundary theory is most, most faithfully represents reality, and the bulk theory is auxiliary, or we can hold both theories to represent the same reality. Now, how might we decide between these options? And also, supposing we kind of go with the normal line on dualities and we accept number three, um, how should we make sense of that option if things have different dimensionality? 
so that's the big question um, in the background. She had the watch, but I don't know how much time have I got. Oh, 20 minutes. Okay. Um, okay, so what are these debates about? Well, here's a quote. Um, it's actually a quote that pertains to the configuration space about the debate, but um, it was a good quote, so stayed in with the configuration stuff, space, but, space stuff. But, uh, so um, there is an arena in which the dynamics does its work, a stage on which whatever theory we happen to be entertaining depicts the world's unfolding, a space that is in which a specification of the local conditions at every address at some particular time amounts to a complete specification of the physical situation of the world. Um, philosophers will probably rec recognize the kind of indomitable style um, in that quote. I mean, this last bit's about separability, and we won't worry about that so much, but, um, or humane supervenience or some such. But, um, but the first bit, that kind of table summing style is, of course, David Albert talking about what's at issue in configuration space. And what he's saying is, look, it's the nature of that arena, that stage, that's at issue in these debates. Um, I think if you think that, you should be really puzzled by ADS CFT correspondence, right? If you think that what we argue about when we argue about which of these representations is correct is something like, you know, what's the fundamental stage on which the world is set, then that fundamental stage had better have a determinate um, dimensionality. But you might get from the tone, I'm going to question whether I think all of that's a meaningful question. So here's the questions I think I do understand. They're not easy questions and they're quite metaphysical questions. Um, but I think I kind of know how we might go about answering them. So here's a question that's really hard. There's lots to be said about it. But I think I have some idea about how we might answer it. Which theory or formulation is more fundamental? You can say a bunch of stuff about that, right? Um, is one of the theories or formulations? By the way, I should say, just going to say theories or formulations constantly because I'm trying to um, equivocate with respect to how we interpret these things. Um, is one of the theories or formulations more general or of larger domain than the other? Right? Um, so more fundamental theories are meant to describe more stuff. Less fundamental theories are meant to be of restricted domain. Um, is one of the theories a restriction of or derivable from the other but not vice versa? Um, that might be a way of understanding which one's more fundamental. Um, but third, slightly more subtly, is one of the theories or formulations more obviously related to some third theory that's more fundamental in one of the above senses? Um, so, maybe I'll just briefly say, because I'm not going to get a chance to discuss it. I mean, if you know anything about the configuration space literature, how that debate ends up going is that the reason why we should prefer what you might call space-time state realism is that it's just not possible to be a configuration space realist with respect to quantum field theory or relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, right? And that seems like a really good argument to me. And the point is that you have some kind of structure that's much more perspicuous with respect to the ontology you think really holds in the more fundamental theory. Um, so there's a question I think we might be able to apply an answer. Here's another one that I spent a bit of time thinking about. Which objects in the theory represent space-time structure? Which degrees of freedom of space are temporal? Um, the reason I think I can make sense of that question is that I think space-time is a fun functional concept. Right? Um, so how you answer questions about which objects represent space-time structure is you just dig around in your theory and you look at which objects play a certain kind of role. And if they play a certain kind of role, they're space-time, and that's it. Case closed. No um, deep metaphysical um, meanderings. Um, so what do I mean by the fact that our concept of space-time is a functional one? Well, if we want to be philosophical about it, um, you could contrast membership of a functional kind with what's sometimes called membership of a compositional kind. Right? Um, so compositional kinds are those where membership or inclusion under the concept uh, is determined by the essential properties of the thing. So if you think you have a deep intuitive grasp on what it is to be a space, what it is to be a space-time, that's independent of what the space-time does or what role it plays in our theory, then maybe you think it's a compositional kind. Um, I think you have some grasp on the property that makes it space-time over and above all the stuff it does. Um, if we think that the concept of space-time is a functional one, we're committed to doing something like the kind of conceptual analysis that's been discussed at various points in the conference. We need to analyze the space-time role, and then we need to look at our theories and we identify what, if anything, needn't be anything, instantiates it in a given theory. Um, now, it'd be nice to say more about the concept of space-time here, right? And, I mean, I'm just going to, well, I'm slightly bit by pointing out that 
when philosophers announce that a concept is functional, they usually do that as the final move in their argument. They don't provide any kind of functional analysis. So if I say a mental state is a functional thing, um, I don't necessarily go and tell you exactly how, to, how you identify mental states. But I'm going to say a little bit more about um, why space time is a functional concept. I have lots more to say, but um, time, etc. So here's some hand wavy things that we might say about the role that space time plays. Well, first of all, most philosophers are committed to the idea that the symmetries of a space time should match the dynamical symmetries of the theory. It's the kind of thing that you bring to bear when you think about Newtonian theories, etc. Um, so if you include that in a functional definition, then you're going to elevate something like the idea that space-time symmetry should match dynamical symmetries from some kind of interpretational heuristic all the way up to something like conceptual truth. Space-times are the kinds of things that match, um, uh, that match the dynamical symmetries of the theories. Um, I don't think that prescription is going to be easy to apply in all cases. Um, so for example, in general relativity, it's not kind of true, but um, it's a little bit complicated when you get symmetries that are generally local, not global. Um, and there's other considerations as well, I and mean, we think space-time has other roles to play, like it governs the behaviour of rigid, you know, Einstein's of packing of rigid bodies is what geometry is about, and, um, uh, and it's got something to do with periodic processes. If those things exist, you wouldn't want to write that in such that you could have no space-time in a regime where there were no um, rigid bodies and clocks. So here's my claim, and I'm not going to argue for it here, but I, I actually read someone like Harvey Brown's work, um, so uh, his book on dynamical relativity, I read as an extended argument for this. I don't know, I mean, he doesn't put things in these terms. But I take it to be an extended argument, effectively, that, that all of these roles that we care about in space-time will be filled by an object um, just if it determines a class of uh, possibly locally preferred inertial coordinates. So the sense in which we can kind of shortcut all of this operational significance um, by thinking about how the space-time structure interacts with the um, our theory in such a way that it creates inertial coordinates. So one little sort of shortcut to thinking about whether we've got space-time in theory is, look, is there anything playing this role of representing the structure of inertial frames? It's going to be a useful thing to think. Um, okay, so let's go back to Albert's question about stages and arenas again. Um, so if we know which formulation of our theory is more fundamental, and we know which objects and degrees of freedom are spatiotemporal, how can we answer the question? What more can we ask for? Um, as you might imagine, I kind of think we have. I don't think there's more to this stage or arena notion than these questions. If you, know, if you want to ask me what's the dimensionality of the arena, like, you know, if you ask me questions about fundamentality, you can ask me questions about what the space-time structure is, and after that, I'm, the mind boggles. But here's the kind of questions that might get fired at me that I don't understand. Um, well, maybe I understand them, and I think they're bad questions. Um, kind of a weasel move in philosophy, right, to claim you don't understand something. Um, uh, but here's one. This is the kind of thing you, you hear, with a bit of table thumping. But is the space, so the fibre bundle space, is, it's a real physical space. That's what I think when I'm a fibre bundle self type list. Well, here's my answer to that. A non-spatiotemporal space is just a mathematical notion. I mean, sure. Mathematical spaces can represent physical degrees of freedom, so they're real and physical in that sense. But I understand what it is for something to represent spatiotemporal degrees of freedom, and I understand what it is to be well represented by mathematical spaces. I don't understand what the additional um, bit of table thumping on sort of real physical space, rather than just degrees of freedom that are well represented um, by uh, mathematical uh, space, is. Um, and then the other kind of question you get is, where does the stuff in the universe live? Where's the, what's the container like? So this, this, you know, this is the arena stage metaphor, um, writ large. And my feeling, that especially when we start ascending it into kind of quantum gravity domains, is like we're just pushing metaphors too far into unfamiliar domains. Uh, we all, you know, learn general relativity at a very early stage, kind of thinking about. Um, rubber sheet geometry and the geometry of two-dimensional surfaces, and it's very tempting to push the kind of metaphors and analogies that we learned early into um, unfamiliar domains where we're saying things about very obscure space-times or very obscure abstract mathematical spaces. Um, but the desire to believe that we have this kind of intuitive understanding of the nature of the container in which we live, I think, is, um, is misplaced. Um, okay, so let's briefly consider how our dimensionality debates answer those questions about fundamentality and space-time structure. Now, I've said that those are the only questions we should care about. And moreover, they're the only questions we should care about, and they kind of cut across each other, potentially, right? It's, 
a functional definition isn't one that has to tell you about fundamental structure. Um, so, what about space time in the fiber bundle? Which version of electromagnetism correctly describes space time? Ah, both do. Both descriptions have ordinary Minkowski space time in them. One is the base space for a fiber bundle, the other in a more traditional role, but both have that structure in there. And there's no argument, I mean, no one would ever suggest that the additional space of the fiber bundle fills the space of your temporal role. If you had some kind of thought about, oh, are there more symmetries here? Couldn't we do something with symmetry? I mean, the fiber bundle isn't even invariant under gauge symmetries. Right? That's not really why it's been introduced. Um, so we can't think of that as kind of automatically encoding additional space-time symmetries. We don't get wonderful explanation or understanding of symmetry by introducing fiber. What about fundamentality in the fiber bundle? Well, which version of electromagnetism offers a more fundamental picture? Um, well, as I said, the fiber bundle isn't really gauge invariant. You can insist, though, that gauge-related fiber bundles represent the same physical reality. You can always play that move. And once you've done that, the gauge-related classes of fiber bundles just, rep um, just correspond neatly to the and There's a sense in which you really are capturing exactly the same information um, in the two descriptions. That's why they're both good descriptions of electromagnetism. Um, You've got no considerations of generality here to fuel any fundamentality claims. So really, there's no point in thinking that one of these is more fundamental than the other. Both descriptions just represent the same non-spatiotemporal degrees of freedom. Right? And then we might want to puzzle out what we want to say about those non-spatiotemporal degrees of freedom. But there aren't obvious reasons to think um, that you should think one of these is more fundamental than the other. Um, yeah. So but to make that work, we have to, you do have to caution the gauge. Orbit, yeah, absolutely. So does Frank do that? Yes, yes, he does. He, he hand waves and says, "Oh, if someone hits me with the whole argument equivalent, I can just make the same move as you do in um, general relativity." Um, okay. So, in light of that, what should we say about ADS-TFT? Well, here's some tentative thoughts. Um, uh, I, this counts as a work in progress. I mean, obviously, yeah. you can see this is inviting. Um, additions from people who know more about the technical details than me. But look, so let's start off by thinking about space-time and ADS-CFT. So should we think of the bulk of the boundary theory as representing space-time accurately and hence giving space-time dimensionality? Um, well, the first thing to bear in mind is one of the great things about thinking of this thing as kind of functionally defined is that kind of leaves it entirely open that both theories might contain something deserving of the name space-time. As long as the space in question plays the right kind of role with respect to the rest of the theory, this is something that could be multiply instantiated right in different ways. Um, so we don't have to have an either or on this question. Um, now, I sort of, in the paper, I think Nick's thought, talk, he said a bit more about, I think, inertial frames than he does here. But there's a sense in which, at least you know, from my naive understanding of the target metric in string theory, or at least its non-compactified dimensions, is playing a pretty traditional role in terms of defining inertial frames. Um, and seems to be space-time as much as uh, things are in classical theories. Um, so it seems reasonable to think that the target met metric in string theory deserves the name space-time. If you think of what's on the other side of the equivalence as just a field theory with a in a flat, with a flat Minkowski metric, you'd probably assume that the metric in the boundary theory also plays a pretty standard role. Um, but I think there are a few caveats if it's a conformal theory on the other side. Um, I don't have any fixed conclusions, but we do need to bear in mind that conformal field theories are pretty weird. Um, and I completely second uh, Nick's comment that we should think about conformal symmetry more. Um, I periodically get really puzzled by scale and then have to stop thinking about it. Um, okay, so here are some naive comments. I mean, they're naive in lots of ways, but in part they're naive because I'm not even going to mention supersymmetry and I can't work out whether that affects any of these things. And, um, yes, multiply naive comments. Um, so conformal field theories right, are invariant under conformal transformations, so local rescalings of the metric. These are a really extreme set of transformations, right? So, yeah, we'll just talk about sort of variations in size. Obviously, it's a local um, rescaling. Um, so that messes around with most of the geometrical properties of the metric. The conformal structure of the metric is a very impoverished structure. Um, and of course, if we're obeying the edict that our space-time structure should match our symmetry group, that means the thing that might represent space-time is the equivalence class of metrics that are conformally equivalent to the Minkowski metric, which is a much less structured space-time than the Minkowski metric itself. I think string theorists know this. I mean, I think that it's just this is more a cautionary note to 
philosopher is looking at it, right? That when people say Minkowski metric, they don't mean anything as richly structured as Minkowski metric that we're familiar with in the case of these conformal field theories. Um, but perhaps I'm correct in that. Um, it's far from obvious to me that a space-time with just conformal structure counts as space-time. I mean, I don't, that it'll have enough associations with all of the kinds of things we expect space-time to do. Um, that's something I need to give more thought to, but uh, you might want to just want to note there's nothing like inertial structure. I mean, there's, you know, geodesics aren't invariant under conformal transformations, right? I mean, think about all of this rich structure you have associated with an ordinary relativistic metric. You certainly don't have it if you only have conformal structure. Um, moreover, as I think plenty of authors are aware, um, because you don't normally think of these four-dimensional conformal field theories as um, anything that could correspond to phenomenological theories. But, but it's worth noting that this kind of structure, four dimensions notwithstanding in this particular example, is just not a candidate in any way for representing phenomenological space-time. Um, our world is manifestly not conformally invariant. There are no giant insects, right? Um, surface area to volume ratio matters in macro laws. <laughs> um, huh? Giant insects might be... Well, it's conformally invariant. There's no notion of a giant. Yeah, but my, I'm saying our world is not... So, you know, the, the very fact that it matters... It's to be giant if there's no metric. So. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> they would have no size at all. No, exactly. <laughs> True. But I mean, if you just if you just want an example that our physics, you know, the basic the basic science, you know, macro science of our world isn't performing very well. But all things surface area to volume ratio matters. This is a quick quick dirty fix. We've got to have emergent conformal variance. Um, yes. Question. I'm wondering if your last two points are basically the same, namely that there's heavy stuff, that there, you know, we have massive particles or massive fields or whatever. Um, because those are the main obstacles. Well, multi geodesics are conformally invariant, so if nothing were massive, then... That's true. Um, so are, are those almost the same point, or is there a significant difference between the two? Well, the point that um, our world's manifestly... Well, they're certainly related, right? Because the fact that we have inertial structure implies that we don't and have... If, if, not, you know, if nothing were massive, then conformal structure would be all we need, and... Uh, uh, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, yeah, there's certainly a relationship between those two points. Um, yeah, we've got same content. Um, okay, but I mean, of course, normal instances of holographic type principles involve CFTs, so um, that's just a comment on those that do involve um, some formal field theories. Um, so moving on to the question about fundamentality, well, look, should we think of either the bulk or the boundary theory as more fundamental? Now, I think there's some technical things here that I am not totally on top of, because if you think of the equivalence as precise, which is normally how people present dualities, right, it's hard to ground any claims of greater applicability or domain. But there's also all of these limiting procedures that are involved in going from um, one thing to the other. Um, and some of those, as I think we saw in the first string theory talk today, um, mean that people claim um, uh, mean that some string theorists claim that one of these theories actually emerges from the other. Um, I don't want to adjudicate on that particular issue right here. Um, if it is the case that you can think of one of these things as, say, a definition or extension of the other, but not vice versa, um, then of course that does ground the kind of claim of fundamentality. Um, that I was discussing. Um, it might also be, I mean, if we had the underlying, you know, this sort of hint of an underlying theory of the other two, right? If you think there's a more fundamental theory beneath um, these theories, then it might be that in the final state of perfect knowledge, we realize that one is more revealing with respect to the structure of the underlying theory. That could ground. So that's the an analog of this thing I briefly mentioned about the fact that um, you might prefer space time state realism because of how it relates to quantum field theory. Could it be that one is more revealing with respect to structure of some overlying theory, some less fundamental theory? That's quite possible. I do that. In which case, you might still have a preference because one is more perspicuous to the oh, sure. ordinary physics than the other. Um, but maybe that might. Yeah, you might have a preference. I don't know if that would be a preference about fundamentality, right? I mean, that might ground a claim that 
the one's less fundamental than the other, it's closer to this phenomenology, it's closer on the ladder of phenomenological. You would have to make that by an argument, yeah. making the relation separate. No, absolutely. No, I'm very, so, so I think the main point here is that I'm very happy for considerations like that to come into this fundamentality debate. Um, but what I'm not happy to happen is for someone to think that somehow the fact that this involves dimensionality forces you to a fundamentality debate. So I think, so look, note that you don't usually have a debate over fundamentality in cases of duality. So part of the kind of law about duality is the representations are equally fundamental. Um, and it might be that some of these kinds of considerations force you into deciding that one of them is more fundamental. But one of the morals of this talk is that, look, just a difference in dimensionality, like we saw with the Fire Bundle case, isn't itself a reason to think there has to be meaningful debate over fundamentality. Um, that's, it's not obvious that um, just uh, a difference in which degrees of freedom the theory puts into a geometric representation is something that we need to be deeply bothered by um, as, a, as a difference between um, two representations. Um, so, conclusions, uh, some suggestions, mostly for philosophers considering dualities of dimension. Um, Bear in mind that deciding which theory is more fundamental mental doesn't need um, to describe on which one to depend on which one better describes space time. Right? So these two issues cross cut each other. You can worry about space time representations and you can worry about fundamentality, and the two things don't have to go hand in hand. Um, and on the approach that I suggest here, you can ask about the dimensionality of space time, but questions about the dimensionality of a more abstract space just boils down to questions about total degrees of freedom and how you've chosen to represent them. Um, so you can just think of the boundary theory as kind of internalizing degrees of freedom that are spatially temporal and the uh, bulk theory. Um, and as, uh, as plenty of authors have noted, right, there's, there's nothing terrible, I mean, plenty of things mysterious going on in ADS-TFT, but you haven't lost degrees of freedom in your theory. What you're doing is switching them from ones that look internal to those that look external. Um, the approach here pushes us towards accepting multiple representations in non-stringy cases where some philosophers have thought it was important to choose. So the idea is that here is that we have these debates in ordinary philosophy of physics where we've been thinking that we have to pick a representation, and I think we don't. Um, but I think once you accept that, it also means that the apparent problems of dual descriptions are a little less daunting than they appear, because there are more cases in ordinary, um, in more ordinary physics that we have to accept that we can have competing representations of the same reality. That's actually it. That's short. <laughs> Could one have framed this type of discussion in something much simpler, like, let's say, Calusa claim, and say, what I'm going to geometrize, mm -hmm. and what am I going to call additional fields and have exactly the same discussion? Sure, so I, th I mean the point of the fiber bundle representation was just to give you a simple example. Yeah, no, no, I mean my point was to see, to, the entire point of this was to give you an example of how the debate goes in something very simple and then apply it to um, ADS CFT. It's, it's quite general. That's right. So you are. Thanks. Yeah, so the other que the question which is probably related to this would be uh, the fact that the CFT lives on a boundary of a space, mm -hmm. would it make it less fundamental than the bulk in the sense that the boundary has, uh, you know, it's part of this, it's like a subspace of the space with a different physics, but geometrically it's just a part of it. So I don't think on the kind of approach I'm advocating here that's the kind of thing that you should think. I mean, so, I mean, I suppose intuitively, if you're thinking you're taking spaces very seriously, right, and you think, well, you know, gosh, and the only way to make a coherent sense of this description is that there's this thing, there's a space, and then there's its boundary, and it's another thing, and it's a subset. But I mean, but I think that's sort of part of the container view um, in a certain sense. I'm certainly that's not how string theorists think it. So if anything, I think the consensus is yeah. of those people who won't want to be fundamental, people think that the boundary um, theory is the fundamental one and that the gravitational theory emerges from it. I just mentioned this because you didn't mention it. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mark, could you go back to slide nine or ten with the fundamentality questions there? Yeah, that one? Yeah, perfect. So what if, yeah, you know, and I can just number one. Only Thank thing. you. Um, well, so what if right now you answered no to all of that? Is that? Then they're equally fundamental. So you're fine with that? With, 
Yeah, yeah, no, I'm very happy with that. I mean, I think, I think that's, I think we're going to be in that case in more situations than we expect. And then we have to make, then we have a challenge, right? Then we've got two competing representations of the, of what we think is the same um, reality that we can't order in a. So I, I'm not familiar at all with the fundamentality debate or literature, but there occur to me at least a few kinds of fundamentalities, like epistemic fundamentality, pragmatic fundamentality, and then maybe something like ontic or metaphysical fundamentality. So could lines be developed that way here in such a case where you do answer no, therefore you're at least prima facie, you know, understanding is, oh, they're both equally fundamental, but and you might parse it into, well, fundamental in what sense? Sure. So, I mean, so if you want to introduce things like pragmatic or epistemic, pragmatic, I mean, so, so obviously one of the useful things about duali these kinds of dualities is they allow you to calculate. You know, one theory might be infinitely more calculationally useful, might be the one that you always go to. Um, so I mean fundamentality to have a kind of a more subscript metaphysical table thumping. Um, and the idea is that we think that maybe these theoretical relations are a guide to that kind of metaphysical fundamentality. But, but yes, I mean, that shouldn't be. I'm sure it's not a finger. Okay. Um, yes, I, I wanted to make a similar point, really, of uh, Mark, because uh, listening to you, I was reminded of this point that um, the gauge, in, it, I only know the electromagnetic case, and elementary philosophers' discussions of that have taught me that, you know, the loops are gauge invariant. A is not. But the loops are both non-local and vastly over-complete. The harmonics, I mean, mm -hmm. that you wrote down. So I do think this is more than that. I always understood you to meaning fundamental, subontic, or metaphysical, yeah. which is how most philosophers typically read it. But I suspect that um, part of what makes us resist your our reading view that you know it's the uh, or a car, is a uh, belief that things like dimension uh, has got to be a definiteness, even though we're perfectly happy with the idea of pros and cons, swings and roundabouts, mm -hmm. in physics in general, for the choice of variables. It's just the fact that dimension is, as the word goes, background for almost everything we ever do in physics. Uh, yes. So. Sure. So I guess... The argument here is just meant to be that to try and cash out why that is is very difficult for the, I mean, so, so, so given that we can have these competing descriptions and they seem to do an equally good job, you might take that as prima facie evidence that we can cope with indeterminate dimension of a certain kind, um, right? And then if you have a kind of additional argument that that's, I think most of the arguments that I can think of that go beyond the kinds of things that I've considered here really do come down to that picture, that fundamental metaphysical picture of the world in which there is a background or a container and stuff plays out within it. And that container is one of the fundamental ontological constituents of the world and it had better have determined properties. Um, I think that that view is being challenged from all over the place in quantum gravity and probably to make, make do without it. And so one of the ideas here is just meant to be to help you make peace with that um, reality. Yeah, sorry, Dave, there's another thing here. Okay. I mean, you might have said the same thing about the radius of space-time as well, of, of, of spatial dimensions, where they might be really big or sort of really small. Um, and I guess you know the point I was trying to make was trying to make earlier is um, you know they're in there's a duality and the same kinds of issues are coming up here, which is I guess it's not quite which is fundamental, but which is the right one, and are there, is there really a difference here? But part of the point that you know one of the things that is sort of relevant in the case of T-duality is, I didn't get to sketch it, but there's kind of an argument, seems like a correct argument, that whichever, whichever um, of the duels you go with, it's good, the prediction is going to be. Both of the duels predict that what you actually observe is a large, is the dimension to be large. And effectively, that's because um, for one duel, the space sort of is large, and you know, you're measuring it using low energy processes which correspond to momentum states, because it's a big radius for long wavelengths, nice slow momentum. In the other space, the corresponding states are going to be on the, on the large winding radius. Um, 
And the idea there is for a small space, so the low energy state, and it's very easy to wind a string around, so the low energy states are going to be um, the winding states, and so you just have the dual processes always on the field. But anyway, you have this kind of result that it doesn't matter which dual you go with, it's going to look big. Is there anything like that in ADS CFT that says it's going to look like one of those? I don't think so, because I don't think either of these things are really candidates for representing phenomenological space time in the way that the T2 LC space is, right? I mean, there's going to have to be a whole secondary story about how the ordinary space of our experience emerges from either of these pictures. Um, well, it wouldn't have to be the the space of our experience, but the space of beings that um, lived in one, lived in ADS CFT space. Or would they, would the, you know, would, because it's not that, so instead of having a sort of, whatever, an a priori metaphysical intuition that there have to be a definite number of dimensions, I'm just imagining, well, I could just look and count how many dimensions there are. Yeah. So if I had to conjecture beings that live in these spaces, right, I would think of them as some kind of complex structure to the, you know, I mean, so you don't need, if you've got these, you've got in these, a duality case, you don't need to say what the beings yeah. are like very much, you just say, oh, they're going to, it's going to be low energy processes or something like that. Yeah, so I don't know if this, I don't, I'm not aware of an argument, but I mean, yeah. And the two people who know most of the subject have like Never mind. So <laughs> this is my backup kind of, but, um, make it up. no, but, I mean, so, <laughs> as part of this picture, right, but it's kind of, and this, you take these dual pictures seriously, um, and, and you take a certain kind of structuralist, functionalist view of what macro-ontology is, right? And you, and you deny that there are higher level theories. I mean, it's perfectly consistent that you have creatures that live in one space and not in the other, right? And that, in that you have some macro-structure that emerges in one description and that doesn't emerge in the other. Well, I mean, there would be creatures in the other, right? If you have creatures in one, you should have dual creatures in the other. I don't know, do you, have tables, do you have tables in one description? Do you have tables in another? No, they have something dual. They are not tables, but they are dual tables. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, Dave. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, like, so, you know, suppose for the moment that, like, the correct theory of our world is dual to some theory on its boundary, right? Like, um, you know, let's say that I am holding fixed when talking about space-time the notion that, like, you know, dimensions are the sorts of things that this is one, this is another, this is another, right? Like, then it's just going to turn out that, you know, the dimensions of space-time on the boundary can't correspond to, like, what I meant by space-time because I'm holding fixed that sort of, like, stipulation, right, that, like, you know, these are dimensions, you know, so, so it's like, when we're, when we're using a theory that's actually describing our world, we make these sort of, like, stipulative definitions, and with those in place, I feel like, yeah, there's a sense in which the, the theory on the boundary is going to turn into, like, a notational variant of the theory on the ball in our world, but, like, you know, it's certainly not the case that, like, space-time in the boundary theory is going to be something that's space or temporal in the sense that I'm sort of, like, setting with my stipulation. Sure. I mean, so, so there's... You're entirely free to say what I mean by space-time is our phenomenological space-time. But in that case, you're going to deny space-time in all of these... I mean, none of these theories are meant to be theories of our phenomenology. Like, these are all um, some more fundamental theory that we're going to emerge from in some complex way, such that the dimensions you're identifying here are meant to be the same. Well, um, I mean, is it, is it the case that in a real string theory, like, the three dimensions of phenomenal space are, like, three of the, the ten or twenty-five, right? So, so in that yeah. case, I okay. will have that, that available to me. Sure, so then you're going to have a more full space, notion of space-time and one where it describes the behavior of rigid bodies that, of your experience. But I mean, it's perfectly possible that you have a theory on the boundary that equally has an analog of rigid body, and then it's just a, it's just a matter of, I mean, yeah, you can hold it fixed that you're talking about your space-time. But principled reasons to refuse to call the other thing space-time seem hard to come by. Aside from it's not the one that you're working out by extension right now. Um, I just had a quick question to try and bring some recent debates in um, analytic metaphysics about grounding. <laughs> so there the idea is not, we talked about what's more fundamental, but what grounds that's about what. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about how that might bring a novel perspective. Um, in as much as I understand questions about what grounds facts about what, um, I take 
I just thought that you. I, 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 just, I, just, I just point to that. I mean, in terms of I mean, when we're off in the realm of highly speculative mathematical theories, to understand metaphysical grounding questions in the absence of relations between theories it sounds fairly impossible to me. Well, so I mean, so this is something I expect to roughly, you know, if the metaphysicians have got their notion of grounding right, they ought to think that maybe the facts about the wider domain theories ground the facts about the smaller domain theories, and that's like a sanity check on their notion of grounding. Yeah, I thought that might be a completely symmetric relationship. Oh, so... It's a really interesting situation. What, so... Each one thing, first one. ground the other. I think if I understood what well, grounding was, yeah. I could answer that. Maybe I'm just not a good enough analytic metaphysician. Fair enough. On that note, let's conclude the formal part of the